when we got in in 97 and we were, you know, Tony Blair's ambition was to lead in Europe, was to put Britain at the centre uh, of the European Union, um, I think it's fair to say that we didn't worry greatly uh, about uh, questions of legitimacy uh, and democracy uh, in what uh, Europe did. Um, I think that the main argument that was made was that if Europe had sensible policies and those policies produced uh, visible improvements in people's uh, working lives, or in ordinary lives, um, then uh, people would regard the European Union as legitimate. And you didn't have to think that much about what kind of democratic process or uh, had gone uh, into taking uh, the decisions. And I think in the political science trade, uh, this is called output uh, legitimacy. Um, uh, well, um, that was uh, the doctrine uh, that uh, we uh, very much uh, followed uh, in the uh, initial period uh, in Downing Street. I think after a while, we then realized that there were some pretty fundamental problems with the way uh, the European uh, Union worked and its institutions, um, and that these were likely to be accentuated a great deal by the growth in size of the European Union uh, through enlargement. So the Prime Minister was very, very much in favour of a much smaller commission. And in all the uh, treaty discussions that took place in the last decade and ran up to the, uh, which resulted in the Lisbon Treaty, Blair and the British government were very much arguing for a much smaller, slimmed down, efficient commission, uh, even if uh, it didn't have a British representative on it. Now we're going to end up uh, with a European commission with 28 members. Now, why does that matter? It matters actually a large body is a weak body. And what's made it weaker and uh, uh, less effective is the fact that all the portfolios within the Commission have all the business of the Commission has been chopped up into 28 separate bits. And each of these 28 bits is headed by a Commissioner with their cabinet and all their staff who are basically trying to make an impact in the bit for which they're responsible. So it's not surprising in a way that there is very little prioritization uh, of what really matters. Um, enlargement also caused a very big problem with the Council of Ministers. The Council of Ministers used to be uh, a kind of fireside chat uh, of the ministers from a union of what, when Britain first joined, uh, was nine members. Uh, and it was quite easy uh, in a small gathering to do deals, behind closed doors, of course, so there wasn't much uh, question of uh, openness, transparency, or legitimacy uh, in that, uh, but it was easier to do deals. Um, when we're dealing with a, uh, a union of 28, uh, it's very difficult to do deals behind closed doors. It's very difficult for political deals to be cut, um, and the whole nature of the process of, of interstate bargaining within the Council of Ministers uh, has, uh, has changed. And throughout this period, the European Parliament became a more noisy and assertive uh, body. Now, I think the general view of uh, national parliamentarians and national governments is that they regard, they really regard the European Parliament terribly seriously at all. Um, uh, they uh, tend to see it uh, as, well, you know, uh, people who fail to get elected to Westminster, to be brutal. Um, that's the uh, uh, general attitude. Um, and, um, and yet, the European Parliament was becoming a much bigger player on the, uh, on the European scene. Now, actually, I think, when I got to know it, I think that the European Parliament is actually quite good as a legislature um, and actually does deal with issues seriously. But in terms of connection with the people, uh, that is very remote. 
And one of the problems, and as John as a journalist will know, is that the, Europe, the, pro the processes of European decision making are extremely difficult for the media to report, particularly the television and radio, because they're so complicated that in the sort of 30 seconds you have to, to make a report, you can't actually explain well, how uh, matters stand on the issue that's under discussion. So there are a lot of fundamental problems uh, with the institutions. Now, our response, Tony Blair's response, was that the leaders had to be clearly seen to be in charge of Europe. And he, therefore, fought very, very hard uh, in the last decade uh, for a much stronger European Council uh, of where the heads of government are represented and making that body much stronger by it having a permanent president. And that came into being in 2009 uh, with the Lisbon Treaty and the appointment of Herman van Rompuy as the first permanent president uh, of the European uh, Council. Now, a lot of um, European traditionalists, federalists if you like, didn't like this because they'd always seen the future government of Europe as being the European Commission accountable to the European Parliament. Yet in terms of legitimacy, what the Lisbon Treaty was trying to do was to put the European Council, the heads of government, at the top, at the apex of the system, uh, determining uh, the broad uh, lines of European policy. Now, has that worked? Um, I think it's partly worked and partly hasn't. 